We want to welcome everyone to our Sunday School class this morning. We are looking at Genesis 18, verses 16 through 26, and verses 31 through 33. We welcome everyone who is here this morning in our Sunday School class. I'm happy to report the heat is on, because it's warm in here right now. It really is warm in here now. I'm just saying. And we welcome you at home. Hope it's a little cooler where you're at. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, it is a joy to come together around your word, whether it is here in the, our Sunday school room or, Lord, at home with our other members that are there. We thank you for your presence with us. That again, Lord, your Holy Spirit is present here and at their homes, Lord, to once again help us to understand the meaning of Scripture, its truth that it holds for us. As we once again, Lord, rejoice in your goodness and grace, in your love and, and tender kindness. So, Lord, again, we ask your blessing upon our time together. We ask again, Lord, uh, that we will participate in heart, in mind, in spirit. We will again be open to your spirit. And, Lord, at the end, we give you thanks for the blessing that this time has been together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our lesson this week comes directly after Abram and Sarah had received a visit from three men. Uh, the Lord God Jehovah incarnate, as well as two angels. After they ate the meal prepared by Abraham, the message was given to Sarah that she would bear Abraham's child, the um, covenant child. And then from there, it seemed that the three visitors then had another mission to perform, and they took off to do that. They faced south towards Sodom. Two of the men, the angels, sent out, set out for that direction. But the Lord God Jehovah, he remained behind to engage Abraham in a remarkable conversation. Before enacting his judgment upon Sodom, he decided to do something unprecedented. He took Abraham into his counsel on his decision whether or not to destroy Sodom and the five cities of the plain. Verse 16, when the men get up to leave, they look down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Abraham, the courteous host, accompanies his guests for part of the way down the road toward Sodom. Now, the writer injects a brief but interesting passage in which God debates with himself whether he should tell Abraham about his, his plans to destroy Sodom, verses 17 and 18. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Abraham hears the Lord speaking to himself, with no doubt attending that Abraham would hear his words. The Lord wants Abraham to know his attentions towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Why does God want Abraham to come in on, on his counsel about Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, first of all, Lot and his family live there. So for Abraham, it's what? It's family. It's personal. It's personal. Second, Abraham needed to know the reason for this terrible destruction of Sodom and these other cities they're about to undergo. He needed to explain it to his children and they to their descendants. Sodom would become the perpetual warning to the nation of Israel that although God is gracious, merciful, and long-suffering, He's also a God of wrath. And He will not spare His wrath when the time of judgment comes. This internal conversation that God is having with Himself overheard by Abraham this kind of conversation did not take place with Job, did it? Job was clueless about the reason for his suffering. What was the reason for Job's suffering? It came after a conversation between whom? God and Satan. Satan says what? Well, Job blesses you. He prays you because of what? Yeah, you're so good to him. Take away your goodness, and what's Job going to do? He's going to curse you in and die. 
Interesting. To Job, God is silent. To Abraham, God speaks. Do you think God often hides what he's up to from us? It may seem that way, doesn't it? It may seem that way. But obviously, as, as we read and study Scripture, we find what? That obviously life in this world is one of what? Suffering, pain, and sorrow. Do you wish God would explain some of that maybe traumatic suffering and pain that you've endured? Would that, would that have helped, you think, or not, if God would explain it? Why we got, you got cancer? Or, or why your, your spouse died? Or, or those things. Would that have helped or not? Does it change the reality of it? Well, I think it would help. Okay, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, for you, that was great hope then yeah. when he said that. And he was speaking yeah. eternally. Yeah. 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 And, and again, again, I think it's 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 inevitable that our lives are so penned down to this earthly world. That again, the, the idea of the eternal plan and purpose of God in our life is kind of just goes over our head, does it? Because we think temporally. We don't think eternally. Well, I think you think much less about eternal life when you're young. And as you get older, you, you realize you are coming to the end of your earthly life, and there is more beyond that. But when you're young, you only yeah. think maybe 10 years down the road. You know, 10 like years down the road. Your, yeah. Your age and your yeah. I, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. you don't know this. What's the benefit to our faith in not knowing what God is doing? <laughs> Why? Well, okay, I got married, and then I knew he's going to die in 20, 30 years. Yeah. Oh, I went on. And again, in reality, every day, what do we have? This day, don't we? That's the only thing we have for sure is this day. Uh, and again, uh, knowing what God is doing, our focus would be what's coming up rather than what is right now. And we wouldn't enjoy the moment. And God's blessings are in each and every moment of life. Is it not? Is it not? How could it also be harmful to our faith if we knew it was happening? What would be our natural in inclination? They, or, or try to protect yourself from it as if we can. All right? Or be so fixated on what's going to happen, we lose the joy of, of today. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. God gives a striking testimony to Abram's character in verse 19. For I have chosen him. Now he's still talking to himself, overheard by Abram. I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. The verb know here conveys the thought that God knew Abraham was his intimate friend. Now, what's the difference between a friend and an intimate friend? That intimate friendship, you can share anything and everything with that person. <clears throat> because you know them and they know you. There's this relationship where you have that ability to be totally transparent. And that's what kind of friendship that God seems to have with Abraham. He could trust Abraham with the information he was to give and knew that Abraham would use it faithfully as a vehicle of instruction to his descendants. 
Again, when God is dealing with Abraham, he's not just dealing with Abraham the person, but what? Abraham the patriarch, who is responsible to passing on to his descendants his knowledge and understanding of whom? Of God. Not by hearsay, but by personal experience. Okay? Because of his special relation to Abraham, he will now draw the veil and allow Abraham to behold the mysterious workings of divine judgment. Why? So that Abraham may teach his children to shun evil and walk in the ways of righteousness and justice. Abraham needed to know how God responds and who God is. So to learn what true righteousness and justice is so they can walk in God's ways and receive what God has promised to him. God says of Abraham, he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right. How faithful was Abraham in doing that? Giving to his children, to his children's children, the kind of instruction of, of how to live righteously and blamelessly before God. Did Abraham's descendants keep God's justice and righteousness? <laughs> no, no, no. Many of them were what? Miserable failures, weren't they? We read it again and again and again. I mean, you read the Exodus, and again and again and again these Israelites uh, you know, turn against God. You read again the kings of Israel. There's not one good king of Israel. A couple good ones of Judah, but very, no good king of Israel. Who are the descendants of, of Abraham? That's also been true of many children raised in the Christian faith. Families who were solid members of churches, who were faithful in bringing their kids to church, to Sunday school, to youth group, and all the rest. And some of those children, what? Have walked away from the church and the faith. How should we respond when that happens? Think a couple things. First of all, it's not forever, but we have to see it for what? For a while. That's one. Like one of the things I've, I've, I've seen in, in my ministry that when kids of faithful Christians walk away from the church, they think it's forever. And they get discouraged, depressed about it. Again, it's not forever. It's only for a while first. Okay? Um, and other, the other, I think another, another issue is there's terrible what? Guilt and shame with that, right? As something that, that they've done wrong. And again, and again, faith is and will always be an individual response to the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And again, we can't make people make that response. It has to come from their heart. So I think it's really important that, again, uh, we, can, you know, we can't take responsibility for our kids when they become age of discernment. We can't. And third, the hope and the faith that we have is what? Raise up your children in the way of the Lord, that when they get old, they shall not depart from it. Okay? Okay. And for parents who have seen their children move away from their faith, I think their biggest encouragement has to be the thief on the cross. Because, again, when did he find salvation? Moments before death. And in my mind... Again, for folks who have lived apart from the church, when there is severe illness in, in, in their family or in their life, what is immediately brought to them? They know where there's hope. They know where there's love. And they know where there is life. And that is in whom? Jesus Christ. And who knows what their response is to the Lord Jesus Christ in those final moments of life? We don't know. But we do know that they know the way, the truth, and the life. And that's our constant hope and encouragement. Okay?
verse 20 and 21. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sins so grievous that I will go down and see if they have done is as bad as the outcry has reached me. If not, I will know. Notice that God did not actually say in so many words he intends to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What does he say? The outcry of their wickedness is so great, he needs to go down and ascertain the situation on the ground. Has God ever done that before? The answer to that question is yes, he has. The question is this, when? Nope. Babel. Babel. Earlier, he came down to Babel to see the rebellion there. Now, it's not that God did not know the full factors without going down to the city. Why? He's omniscient. He knows everything. Rather, it was for the purpose that people might know directly that God had actually seen the full situation before he acted in judgment. Why is that so important? Because this judgment would not be a random act because God heard something that upset him, but he saw it with what? his own eyes. He was personally witnessed to it. So here's my question. What makes the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah so great and so grievous? There weren't very many people that were Christians there. They, more than any other cities in the land of Canaan, had seen the power of the Lord. How? Remember, they were miraculously delivered from a horrible fate at the hands of the king of the east. From whom? By whom? By Abraham's divine empowered rescue. Remember? Secondly, they had heard the testimony of Melchizedek about the God of Abraham, who he is and what he has done. And third, even Lot who now lived where? In Sodom. Must have witnessed to them to some degree of this God of his uncle Abraham and the great and marvelous things they had done. God had given these cities and its citizens a special opportunity to know him. And yet they rejected him and fouled into even more gross wickedness than before. That was their great and grievous sin. They, unlike many in the land of Canaan, had a personal experience of the power and the love and protection of God. And what did they do? They used it for their own good, and then in the life that were given to them, to return back to their land, they turned their back on God and did what? Sin grievously. In verses 20 and 21, the Lord tells Abraham about his mission. That the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah, presumably by their victims, have been great and has brought him there. Who is crying out in our society today? because of the great sin done against them or the great atrocities that they are experiencing? Do you think? Are you talking about No. <laughs> <laughs> I heard everybody's complaining. You know, no, I'm just talking about in, the, in our world. Obviously, obviously, I think, again, there are Christians out in the Mideast that are being persecuted. Yeah. Yeah. How about in India in their COVID experience? Where they are literally just dropping off cylinders of oxygen and people are hooking up to those because they have none. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. No vaccines. Nothing. Uh, uh, and they're dying by the tens of thousands. Does that touch the heart of God? 
But having brought that up, <laughs> here's a question, and, and this is uh, Steve Langen's question, but I think it's a good one. When you see protesters rising up against police misconduct against African Americans, are you tempted to dismiss them just as the grumbling of troublemakers? Or are these voices of people whom cries are coming before God? That's an interesting question. That's an uncomfortable question, <laughs> but it's an interesting question. Interesting. And here's the follow-up question. Is the knowledge we gain of problems from a distance different than actually experiencing it? Yeah. And how many times do we make judgments about knowledge we gain from a distance? Because when you see something from a distance, what's the tendency to do? To undervalue it, blow it off, make excuses or explain it a different way. And here's the question that got me. Do you think you'd have a different attitude toward racial prejudice if you had actually experienced it yourself? And, and again, my only, my only example of that would be uh, the uh, senator from South Carolina. Yeah. yeah, who himself experienced it, even as a senator. Did you hear his speech? Yeah, well, we can't get, we don't want to get into that. We don't want to get into that. <laughs> But I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, this is a, a senator of the United States still experiencing that. Now, um, I spent some time in the South in the 70s in the military, South Carolina. You know, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, day and night different there than it's up here. Day and night difference in the 70s down there. It really, really was. And hey, all of us have lived through that, right? Selma and all of us have lived through it. But again, have we ever gone there? and seeing the white-only bathrooms, black-only bathrooms, yeah. all of them. I ran Did you? the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I think this idea of seeing it up close and personal is much different than talking about it in abstract terms, okay? And again, I just, again, uh, I, the reason I only ask those questions is because again, I think again, first-hand knowledge is, if we're gonna talk definitively, it's almost have to be first-hand knowledge. You know, we really have to. Because when we don't, when we talk about what we assume or think or what we believe rather than what is, it becomes a whole different conversation. It really, really does. And the Lord goes down there to see for, themself, see for himself why. Because, again, his justice is always what? Just. His righteousness is always right. And how does he do that? Because he has intimate knowledge with his omnipresence and omniscience. Okay. In this next section, Genesis 18, verses 22 through 33, we find a remarkable example of intercessory prayer. Abraham was naturally concerned with Lot and his family, but no doubt he also knew many of the other people in these other four cities. Why? Because years ago, he saved them from the northwestern king. And don't you think as they made the trip back, they thanked Abram? And he got to know them personally, who they were, their stories? Though he was aware of the depravity of their practices, he was concerned for them and hoped against hope that they may return to God. Now, Although Sodom is the specific city referred to this in this dialogue and the chief city of the five, make no mistake, all five cities of the plains was intended to be the subject of ultimate destruction. Okay? So we're not just talking about Sodom or Gomorrah. We're talking about five of the plain cities um, that were around Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 23. Then Abram approached him and said, Will you sweep away righteous with the wicked? Now, please note, Abram is not asking God to do away with justice and allow the wicked to go unpunished. His concern is what? For the specific, for the righteous in the city. Lot and his family was a concern for Abram. 
But his main interest, his main focus is the larger issue of God's justice as it relates to the destruction of whole cities and their citizenships. Abram could not believe that God, the judge of all earth, would destroy the righteous with the wicked. Abram's focus was not the people in Sodom who were sinning unrelentlessly, but those who were walking in a relationship with God, trying to please him. He believed that Lot was an example of that kind of person. Okay? Do you think he had any idea what percentage of the people were not with Good question. 20, let's go 24 and 25. What if there were 50 righteous in the city? Would you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous? If far be it from you to such a thing, to kill the righteous and the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike for, far be from you. You will, you not, will not the judge of all earth do right. Abraham pleads with God to spare Sodom for how many righteous? Where did he get that number? Did he make it up? Abram thought he knew at least 10 righteous people in Sodom. Who were they? Lot, his wife, his two sons, his two married daughters with their spouses, his two unmarried daughters, which equals what? 10. Yeah, Lot, his wife, two sons, that's four. His two daughters with their sons, with their husbands, that's eight. That's eight. And two more is ten. Okay? Now, Abraham infers perhaps there were that same number in each of the other four cities. Okay? So he intercedes with God to spare the cities if God could find 50 righteous people living in them. What do you think of Abraham's tactic? Did you know when you started, you just down? What is Abraham focused on in this intercession? He's, he's focusing on the righteousness of God. Okay? Now, we see the righteousness of God as bringing what? Destruction to Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham sees the righteousness of God as what? If there's any righteous there, God will not what? Destroy them. Exactly. 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 Interesting how people see the righteousness of God different. All right? So we just counted 10, but you know, yeah. still destroyed it. Yeah, right. Okay. All right. There. We're going there. Okay. All right. We're going there. <laughs> All right. And the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. God knew exactly how many righteous people were in these five cities, did he not? And guess what? It was way less than 50. Way less than 50. Nevertheless, God agrees if 50 could be found, he would spare the cities. This shows the general mercy of God that those in the world often experience. Unbeknownst to them, because of the righteous people of God who are living in their midst. Okay? When God agreed, Abraham continues to pray. We know this prayer, right? He goes from 50 to what? 45. 45 to 40. 40 to 35. 35 to 30. 30 to 25. 25 to 20. 25 to 15. And 15 to 10. Now, there's no way of knowing whether God would have spared the city for, say, four people. Who were the number that escaped from Sodom and its destruction? And they were who? And his two unmarried daughters. Okay? Huh? She got out, but we have other issues with that one. We'll, we'll, we'll do that next week, okay? <laughs> Abraham, and this is interesting another thing. Abraham may not have been close enough in fellowship with Lot for many years to realize 
that his own family members, that is Lot, his children, the spouses of his children, could have been largely unregenerate and themselves part of the problem in Sodom. Okay? Because again, where did Abraham hang out? He was in the wilderness, the desert. He was wandering around and living a nomadic life. All right? What happened to Lot? He was outside of Sodom, but then he... So what were the chances that Abraham's going to visit Lot or Lot's going to visit Abraham? First of all, Lot has no idea where Abraham is because he's wandering, he's wandering with, his, with his... Okay? And for Abraham, he knows... He, does he know that Lot moved into the city? Who knows? Who knows? All right? Maybe he did know that they were part of the problem. But he felt his prayer would become totally selfish if it was focused only on Lot himself. Verse 33. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abram, he left and Abraham returned home. When the dialogue was over, when God finished with Abraham, God went what? His way. And where was that? No. Where is God going? Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah, Sodom and Gomorrah. All right. And where did Abraham return to? His tent under the oaks of Marmory in Hebron. Now, several things impress us as we read this amazing prayer of intercession of Abraham. Three important issues principles become evident. First is this, and this is the one that we as good Calvinists need to embrace because we don't embrace it enough. God does not want to bring judgment on any city or person. His desire, his intent is to what? Is to bless, not to punish. And so often we as Calvinists who are very legalistic, when we see God and we talk about his righteousness, we talk about what? Judgment against sin. But here, when you think about Abraham's initial request in five cities, that their people cry out because of the great sin being done in them, that God would spare the cities. What does that talk about? That's grace. That's mercy, isn't it? And even agrees if there's what? Ten. Which means there'd be two in each city. God would spare judgment. So again, God's desire, his intent, is always to bless, not to punish. Because what is the intent of God's punishment? What's the intent of God's discipline? It's not to hurt, cause pain, but it's to bring them what? Back to him. Back to him. Okay? So again, God's punishment is not an end in itself. It's always a means to an end. And the end is what? To be able to, again, share and show his mercy and his love. Okay. Secondly, the remarkable influence even a tiny minority may have for good is noteworthy. Take note of the Preservated power of a few righteous people. For the sake of ten good people, God would not destroy Sodom. Why? Because with those ten good people, they were salt and they were light. And if they were salt and light, what was the possibility? Yep. Others would come, change, and transform. By the presence of God-fearing people, the overwhelming power of evil is restrained and the wrath of God is turned back. Let no one think of their ministry or their faith as useless. Regardless how small a number one may be able to reach for the Lord, their life, their witness, their faith radiates with the presence of God and where the presence of God there is light and there is love, and there is hope. 
And we see that again and again and again uh, in, um, in foreign nations where missionaries go. I mean, you think of nations like China, like North Korea. Okay? Um, the church is there. You can't see. They're not very prominent, even out in, uh, uh, out in the Mideast the same way. And yet, again, why are those places not consumed by God's anger? Because he has salt and light there. And their witness is powerful. And third, Abraham's persistent pleading for Sodom reveals an unshakable faith in two things. The ultimate justice of God and the goodness of God. Okay. The ultimate justice of God and the goodness of God. His intercessory prayer was reverent, was it not? Was it not reverent? It wasn't presumptuous, telling God what he has to do and why he has to do it. It was persistent and it was definite. Notice that through this prayer, Abraham recognized and appealed first to the righteous character of God and second to the loving kindness of God in making his request. His request was always in conformity with the revealed will and character of God. So even in Abraham's intercessory prayer for Lot, for his family, for Sodom, Gomorrah, and the rest of the cities, his prayer was all about whom? God. Not himself. What he wanted, what he desired, or about Lot. It was always about God. And his petitions, what he asked for, was always in conformity with what he knew was the will and character of God. That's powerful intercessory prayer. Because when you and I think of intercessory prayer, what do we think it is? It's getting God to do what we want him to do, right? It's trying, trying to convince God, you got to do this. This would be the best for me, for my family, whoever. Trying to get God to do what we want. Abraham's intercessory prayer was what? God, be God. Do what I know that who you are, what you need to do. And again, his intercession prayer is, I know you're not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. So what he tried to define is what? Uh, any kind of righteous person there. Right? Anyone. Even ten in five cities. But again, it was on the righteousness of God that would not destroy them for their faith. And in the end, he's, how did he end his prayer? He said, again, you are the judge of all heaven and earth. You do what you do. And it will be right. So again, in our intercessory prayer for folks, again, I think, again, what we need to focus on is not so much uh, what we want the outcome to be, but also the needs of the individual and the character of our God and bring those two things together. Because that is a prayer that God will answer. Because he wants to bless, he wants to love, he wants to encourage, he wants to support. Any questions? Comments? Go ahead. Do we have any idea how large these cities were? Sodom was the largest of it. And it was, it was, it was, I mean, again, the, these cities in this area here, they were, again, they all had city walls. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at, you know, hundreds, hundreds. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, we, we, we keep on showing that, don't we? Yeah, I like yeah, okay. All right, here it is right here. All right, here it is. All right, all right. All right. The scale. The scale. Okay, here's the Mediterranean Sea, all right? This is the Dead Sea. And this is the Sea of Galilee, all right. All right, and this is the land of Canaan, right? Now, Sodom is here, okay? These, this would be the land, this is the towns of the, of the, uh, of the plains, 
these are the planes here. All right? So, so that's what you have here. Sodom is just below this, the Dead Sea. And this is the plains. So again, no mountains here, pretty much plains. And this, and Gomorrah was on this side over here. And the other five cities. So again, you have, again, when one city grows, there's other cities that come across it. So that's kind of what we're talking about, this area right in here. And now, Hebron was up here. So again, Abraham and Lot, they were separated. I mean, you know, this doesn't look like a very long way. But you walk through a desert once. <laughs> and it's a hike. It's a hike. It's a hike. Yeah. And again, and again, obviously you just can't cut across, but you've got to go, you know, or either around or whatever. So, so this is what this is kind of the area we're talking about. I mean, yeah, you know, they. Uh, we, if, you go, if you ever go to the Dead Sea, so you've got to go in it because then you float, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's because it got so much salt. It's worse than the ocean. So that, that's, this is the area we're talking about here. And like I said, and Hebron, as we said, was, was, was up in, in this over, over here. So again, um, that, that's what we're talking about. And these were the five cities here. And again, these five cities, pretty connected. So it's, it's not like you know you've got 30, 40 miles between these cities. You're looking at 510. So that they're all connected as far as being able to get around. Okay. I'll put up a map next week. Next week, I'll put up a much more, much more exact map. We're not meeting next week. Well, when I talk about next week is when we meet again. How about that? I should say when we meet again. And that gives me a, that gives me a good clue here. For those who are watching with us, we will not have class next week, so don't look for a, a telecast because uh, these folks won't be here. I won't be here. I'm going to New Jersey. See my granddaughter. But we're going to be back the 13th, Genesis 19, the 20th, Genesis 21, and the 27th, Genesis 22. So you can keep your guides. Uh, this is going to take us to the end of the Sunday school year. And then we hopefully start up in September here on Sunday. Lord willing. Lord willing. Anyone else? Then let's end in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this lesson on prayer. Lord, a prayer that makes it all about you, that again appeals to who you are and, and what you are about, that affirms what you have revealed of yourself to us, not just in the pages of Scripture, but also, Lord, in, in the living of life itself, patient, enduring, loving, kind, compassionate, understanding. Lord, again, in our prayers, as we lift them up for ourselves, for family, friends, and for church, again, Lord, help us to have the heart of Abraham, to build our prayers on your righteousness, of who you are and, and, and what you're about and of your love and grace that moves and motivates you in every action and every answer of prayer that, that you give. And Lord, as, as we build our prayers on, on those two pillars, we thank you again, Lord, for the answers that we receive. Want to lift up prayer, Lord, for those of, of our Sunday school class that need you in special ways. We pray for Bud and uh, for Judy Scottman as she continues to deal, Lord, with cancer that's found, Lord, uh, throughout her body, uh, in her bones and in her lungs, Lord, and in her, her liver. Uh, again, Lord, just watch over them as decisions need to be made as they go, Lord, to doctors for um, treatment options. And Lord, again, just give them wisdom that they need to have in, in making these decisions. Be with their children and their grandchildren, Lord, who are also a part of this. Again, Lord, may we just hold them up and lift them to you. And know again, Lord, that in their need, you'll be gracious, you'll be kind, and, and you'll be loving. Again, Lord, be with those uh, who of our class who are still getting the uh, vaccine. Uh, we thank you again, Lord, for those who have received it. Uh, again, Lord, for the peace of mind that it gives us, uh, for the freedom, Lord, it allows us to have. And we ask again, Father, just for those um, who are still dealing with COVID in our community. As we know that this Zealand Hospital, Lord, is almost 
to max capacity, bring healing health to each and every one, and Lord bless the families as well. Again, Lord, we thank you for this time together in your word. And as we leave, Lord, we rejoice that you leave with us to protect, to provide, to love, and to care for. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.